Hello from Cork to the world. This is the Song Collector Podcast, brought to you by Roy Buckley Music. How are you, Roy? Nice to be back again. Happy New Year, my friend. Happy New Year to you too, bye. How's the farm? Very good. We have a busy few podcasts ahead because you've been busy lining people up to talk to us. You've given me a list uh, before we recorded and we really are going to have some fun over the next few months. Uh, New music still coming in. We're going to select a bunch of those songs and do a special show with them in the months to come. I think we should. I definitely think we should. I mean, there's some great stuff coming in. Yeah. Um, I'm meeting a lot of people when I'm gigging or around town or whatever and uh, a lot of up-and-comers and, and a lot of well-respected people who are at it a long time, PJ, yeah. have been saying they're going to send me stuff and a lot of them have and we've... I mean, the uh, the email inbox is full. Yeah. So and, and I said about my own uh, day job, it, it's hard to get a new Irish song played on the radio these days. So Big time. You can get it played on this podcast. So songcollectorpodcast at gmail.com This is why we're doing it because... At least we're able to give people a platform. Yeah. You know, where, so, where us, some Irish radio is, is really living us down. So new acts and new songs coming in a future episode. I want to start today, though, or we want to start. I remember buying this woman's records in the late 90s. She had a most incredible voice. She was a stunner. <laughs> And she's still both incredible <laughs> voice and a stunner. But you surprised me a couple of years ago when you told me that Leslie Dowdall was still busy and still active and still making music. She still got it, man. What a singer. What a huge range in that woman's voice. Yeah. And uh, she, she's really nice. She can go from soft, sort of smoky vocal right up to a big, huge... Yeah, crescendo. she can let loose. She really can. Her voice is still as strong and powerful as it ever was back. She works a lot with our mate Mikey Hanrahan. She does. I mean, sure, they were all around the same um, time because you had in two and Nua, Leslie's group were, were going and Stockton's main Mike's group were, were, mm. were, they were, they were everywhere back in the day, you know. Yeah. And and they gigged together and we've you brought them down for one of the song collector sessions a couple yeah, of years ago. Yeah, I've just been speaking to both of them recently and uh, uh, during um, 2019 uh, we, we'll get them back down for another show as well. Mm. Let's have a listen to one of the songs that she made her name with. Did Leslie get a lot of awards for that back in the day? She she did. Was it around 97 or something that came out? It's a few years ago now. You're dating me here. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just listen to it. Leslie Dowdall, wonderful thing. Come closer and stand by me And we shall be free And stick by me and then guide me
listening to the Song Collector podcast, brought to you from Cork, Ireland, by Roy Buckley Music. Roy, I think it was the PAV where she performed with Mikey. She's after doing a, a few sessions now with Mikey around the place, but yeah. And I was sitting up in the loft in the PAV. God, I miss that venue. That was a great venue for the for the gigs, man. And I had a no. shiver me timbers moment <laughs> when she did wonderful things. Just fantastic. That's Leslie oh, Delta. Yeah. We'll hopefully get to hear from her again in Cork very, very soon. Now, the man who is the subject of our feature interview today, legend doesn't even start to go there. Finbar Fiori, I, absolute God. You introduced me to Finbar last year before we did this interview, and I could have spent the night just sitting listening to the man telling stories before he even took a musical instrument into his hand. How many does he play? How many instruments? Yeah. All of them, I think. <laughs> all of them, he plays them all well. When, he, when he's on stage... For anyone, Surrounded, he's, isn't he? <laughs> he's got his own little instrument section. Yeah, I mean, he has pipes around him and he has his banjo down next to him and a guitar and the, the mm. whist, tin whistle and... God, a gorgeous banjo, banjo player. Anything he plays, everything. Well. And the pipes. And that, that voice as well, that, that storytelling yeah, voice yeah. and the character. A couple so of it, jokes during the gig, brilliant like, stories from back on, uh, all through the years with, with everybody. He's got a he's, voice like, like gravel in a tumble dryer. It's just <laughs> gorgeous. Uh, man, I, I, I've been very lucky to be around uh, Fimber. We, we, we speak on the phone uh, yeah. every couple of months. So when he's down in Cork, we always yeah. meet up. But oh, he's I, back later in the in the year, isn't he? Again, he is. He's doing the opera house. I think. I think it's uh, April. I, th- I think it's the thirteenth. Okay. So don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it's around that. Okay. okay. Guaranteed to sell out anyway. Again. Well, we met him backstage at the Everyman um, for a chat before his last Cork gig. I remember um, the first time I met Finbar. I I was about. Um, Actually, it was about 10 years ago. It was 2009. I was after putting out the City by the Lee album. And then I got a phone call from um, the Opera House. Would I like to open up for Finbar? And I was going, yeah, <laughs> to, you know, of course. <laughs> so um, I think Dominic Max Sweeney, that was his name. He was the promoter on it. And he was a very nice man to, to deal with and looked after me. So um, actually, um, Dave Brown came and did the gig with me. We... we we did all the, the songs uh, from mm. the Cedar by the Lee album before Fimber. But about three weeks before that, there was um, a promo concert to you know uh, sell the tickets mm. or, uh, for, the, for the gig. And it was over in the Flying Enterprise Lounge. Yeah. And um, so same kind of thing. You know, I did like a half an hour and then Fimber did you know, an hour or 45 minutes or something mm. as a, a promo thing. But I remember um, I was finishing my, my stint and... Finbar came on and I was just getting up to go away and he caught me by the hand and he just goes, Sham, do you know the boatman? I was like, yes, oh, I was about to do this. <laughs> and did it boatman with him and then um, I went off and he called me back to do um, to play uh, Sweet 16 with him and, and Red Rose Cafe. And I was a 21-year-old kid and like, loved folk music and all that. I was like one of the icons, one of, one of my heroes, you know, just doing that. Again, like that that's the kind of guy Finbar is. Handing man. on the craft, I think, is what In in a way, yeah. I, I suppose it is, PJ. Like you're very lucky and he'll sit and talk to you and you can yeah. ask him about songs and he loves talking music anyway. Yeah. So there's that another um another time I, I was playing in the INEC in Killarney uh, with him, he was doing this it was a gorgeous gig because it was Finbar just Finbar and his son Martin mm. Fiori, who's an incredible musician, great songwriter as well. And I, I, I've I'm lucky enough to become friends with Martin over the years. Um, mm. He drop into your gig if he's in Cork. Sometimes he, he's he's called into one or two of mine, and just uh, what a, what a player he is too. But that was, that was a really special night because his father and son on stage in 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 Killarney, and I, I never forgot that night either. So as the years go on, you know, you you'd, you'd cross paths, especially mm. when you're all gigging and around the place and whatever. But Finbar, uh, I never forgot that at that moment. Yeah. And he just caught me and said, do you know what a boat man, you know? <laughs> I was like, I never thought that I'd get to do that with that, with that legend, you know? And that was it, it was brilliant. Yeah. Right. I really remember, uh, he kept in touch then and I'd keep in touch and you'd ring him up and whatever. And um, just, just an absolute hero, you know? To give him an idea, to give listeners an idea how interesting the man is to talk to. As you'll hear in a few seconds, there was a half slab of beer 
on the table in the room where we were yeah, interviewing and right. there wasn't a soap touched we just kept <laughs> yeah, talking yeah I know I know I wasn't brave enough to take one of the bears beers and all <laughs> alright listen here he is uh, this is backstage at the Everyman Theatre last year this is Finn Barfjord when first I saw the love light in your eyes the question, I always start these ones with, although with you, it was probably in, in the cot. Um, when did you decide that music is what I'm doing and I'm doing nothing else? Oh, I suppose the day I was born. <laughs> I don't have a clue. I remember, I was, you know, talking to, just, and Roy, I just grew up with it, you know. It's just a part of me, like Eddie and Paul and George. My father took us, each one of us, when we, when we were growing up, and he would take us to Clare or take us busking. I love going busking with him, you know, because you pick up a few bob. It was great crack. But we never sort of played in Dublin. We wouldn't busk there, you know. We'd busk, go down the country to a match or something like that or hook up with, you know, the other lads, you know, we on the road, you know. You had uh, Mickey Dunn's um, father, old Mickey, and uh, you had Hunter and Christy, and they were great players, you know, the three boys, you know. And I, I used to love when they'd meet up with them. My father would meet up with them because they'd feed me chocolate. <laughs> And lemonade all day. We bursting off the seams when I get back. How old would you be? I bet I was six or seven, you know. The whistle. Um, what, what was the first instrument that <coughs> they put in your hand? A tin whistle. Yeah. When I was only a kid, I played the whistle. And I got really good at it when I was about seven or eight. My father got me a half set of pipes. But, um, and um, then there was a great piper called Tommy Moore. Tommy played with the Finton Laura pipe band, which were the war pipes, you know, the Highland pipes. But he also was a, a great Illum pipe player, you know. So Tommy had a B flat set, Kina. So he loaned them to me when I was only a kid. And I learned to make reeds by making reeds for them. There was no reeds in them. So I grew up on the B flat set then. So I had a huge span of my hands, you know, from playing the flat set from a very small kid. Then when I was about 13 or 12 or 13, my father got me the concert set from um, from here, from Kennedy at Cork. Oh, yeah. Alphonsus Kennedy made me set. I remember coming down and the chanter actually that he made he, he, the chanter was supposed to be 14 and a half inches, that's what the Illumpoi chanter, the concert chanter, but it was only 14. So he made the chanter anyway, although the wood was too short. So my chanter was an E, but the rest of the pipes were concert D. So I used to have to tune the regulators, which gave me a terrible time trying to get the regulators to fit the chanter, you know, because the chanter, or, or bring the chanter down to D, make a longer reed or a wider staple, you know. So it gave me all of that. But I never liked it in D. I always put it used to keep it in the key it was, which was E. So when Eddie sang with me, he tuned the guitar up to another key. So actually when he did a far little remake anyway, it was in um he would have been singing an A, you know? Yeah. So that was an incredible height as well he was at, you know. So and of course uh, <coughs> I thought it didn't like me anyway, it was written by your pal uh, Jerry Rafferty. That's right, Jerry you had know? written the song and Jerry was with Billy at the time they Actually, they just broken up, yeah. yeah. And uh, Jerry was going off to America, and he—I remember Jerry gave us a song, and I was living in Peebles at the time, and he was still in Ireland, and he gave me the song in Edinburgh. I met Billy and Jerry, and they were just shaking hands. They were just bye bye, you know. And uh, we all wished Jerry the best of luck. He was going to LA, and the next thing about uh, three months later, out came this clown to the left of me. Jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you, and I could, and I knew it was Jerry straight away. Yeah. And he was straight into number one all over the world. And, and I said, as well. Was well, that was a few years later. Right, now that was seventy three, seventy two, but this was nineteen seventy. It was just amazing, you know. So mm. his song with Eddie and I that he'd written had taken single of the year, and he was number one with his own that song. Was on the, the, at the same, the time. John Peel yeah. show, yeah. I mean. I remember uh, uh, when you said that, I, I got a, the shock of my life. Yeah. You took the Beatles off. It was between yourselves and the Beatles for the, for the number one for spot, the, yeah, for, for the, the single of the year, year yeah. and you knocked them off with it. You knocked yeah. Jojo, I believe, wasn't it? Right, yeah. yeah, and you took them off the spot where their father didn't like me anyway. I mean, especially around that time, because the Beatles were, were Beatlemania, you know? Yeah. They were winning everything, and you took them out, man, you know? And John Lennon at the time, I remember, I remember meeting George Harrison before he died. Uh, there was Eddie Jordan introduced me to him. I did a party for Eddie in London. The Formula One for that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know Eddie. Well, he used to come to the Wexford in years ago, played the Baron with us. But um, he, um, 
he introduced me to him and I had a good day with Mikey Hannon was with me right. the last time I was with him actually in the and Mikey was absolutely flabbergasted when he met him you know so it was lovely to sit down but he told me that when John Lennon heard the pipes he went crazy on the pipes he wanted to know what this instrument was right. so he you know he, went, he, he actually lived in Sligo for a while he had a little island off the coast there in Sligo and he lived there for a while to get away from all the madness and uh, <laughs> he met up with the Mac Peak family. And the Mac Peaks for the first time he saw Dylan Pipes, he couldn't believe the tone of them. And of course, Francie took him in, and I think he bought a set off Francie Mac Peak <laughs> in the end. And, but I, I mean, you know, you have to grow up with the pipes, you just can't play them, you know. But uh, it was a great sort of trip, you know. And uh, we were on the road at the time, we just finished with the, with the Clancy Brothers, I didn't know, you know. Mm -hmm. We were with them for three years before that. Uh, we travelled America with them, we had a great time, so it was a great sort of... How did that come about? I mean, you, you, we got into it one time, you, you were telling me and uh, someone came over chatting to you and we never got back to finishing the story, but were you, you were telling me about you, you were in a, one of the universities and the, yeah, the Clancy's came into you and they, that, that, the, the very moment they asked you to join the band. I remember it was Stafford University, Eddie and I had just gone up another notch, you know, it was 1968, at the end of 67, 68, and uh, Martin, our son, he was yeah. just born at the time, I remember, yeah, and it was, couldn't have happened at a better time, you know. fantastic musician. And uh, the three lads walked in, Tom, Paddy and Liam, and said uh, Tommy Macon was leaving them. And would we like to join? And I said, yeah, why not? So we teamed up. We didn't realise how big they were. We didn't realise how big these concerts were coming yeah. up. And when you think about it, the classic was that Liam didn't play concertina at the time. Liam only played the nylon string guitar. He learned to play the concertina from Louis Killen. Oh, yeah. who joined the Clancy Brothers That's after right, we left them, you know, so he wouldn't even, and all he had between them literally was a guitar and a couple of harmonicas. So you came over from yeah, Ireland you on, yeah. and you were literally yeah. walking into Carnegie Hall yeah. and all those huge gigs, imagine that, yeah. Well, we had ammunition now, I mean, we had pipes with us now, we'd, we had 12-string guitars, we had a 5-string banjo and you could hear it the other side of town, you know, yeah. and as well as that, we knew exactly every song the boys did, it, yeah. so it was a piece of cake, you know, for Eddie and I to back them, you know. But we had a ball, and they taught us stage personality, which I thought was great. Masters, that was amazing, you know, and they were great ambassadors for Ireland. I never saw them put a foot wrong, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And even though they drank a little bit here and there, we all did, you know. So they were young men having fun, you know what I mean? Well, Eddie and I would never touch the, sh the top shelf, we would never go near spirits. We'd have a beer, maybe, you know, but we wouldn't drink because the concerts were too big. Yeah. We couldn't afford it, and the boys needed us, you know. And we never let them down. I remember we played in Chicago, there was 6,000 people at the gig in Chicago. That was a big crowd for folk musicians, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, nice. our first gig was Carnegie Hall, you know. So, and the write-up on the New York Times, you know, the next day after we'd done, all the critics were there, and we got the, we got the green light to go, yeah. It was great. Well, that, that's mad, because in, in the Clancy Brothers, they, they would do Carnegie Hall, PJ for like a week and stuff, you know, and the boys and sell it out. You know, so you had Clancy's and Fiori's together um, and that, that's what a combination. Bobby Clancy who was singing with Peg at the time. Bobby had never been with the Clancy brothers but he was the middle brother. But he, like we, he, the Clancy tried Eddie and I singing and we couldn't because we did double an accent that didn't fit, you know. <laughs> so Bobby was sitting there so I remember saying, try Bobby. And Bobby come, I was mad to, mad to go and he fitted like a glove. So mm -hmm. now the four brothers of the Clancy's were together for the first time and myself and Eddie. So you had two Furies and four Clancy's. And did we rock Just Carnegie Hall? Huh? Get out of the way. <laughs> and Bobby is a great musician too. You know, Bobby's a lovely guitar player and a good yeah. five-track banjo player too. So we go crack as well as having great music. You know? Before we get on about about the the, the four brothers and Davy Arthur, I, I always wanted to to because I don't think it, get, it gets documented enough. I wanted to ask you about your dad Ted, um, because to my mind, those guys of his generation and I know. Ennis and all these guys who used to be in your house when you were a kid, but without them doing that and writing the sheet music and, and passing it on and stuff, it wouldn't be heard as a huge dead ode to people like your father, man, and I would like to know what he was like at home, like was he kind of um, was he kind of strict with you enough to say, hey, come on, you're not practising your instrument? Yeah, he's very smart. Or, or was was he, did he leave it to you for you to he's find the love? No, he was very clever. He knew, you know, we did. You couldn't tell the man a lie, you know. He'd, he'd search out in two seconds, you know. And you didn't bother anyway. You'd be wasting your time with him, you know. It just, you were with him. We never called him dad or sore. We called him Ted. 
Like his name is Ted, you know, or Tyke. So we called him Ted because my ma called him Ted, you know. Mm-hmm. But we, he wouldn't. He was one of the most beautiful characters you ever could meet, you know. And always having a bit of fun, you know. He was always pulling you like you know, there's always something going on, you know. Mm-hmm. And you'd wake up in the morning, you'd ask him, you'd be going maybe after the pictures just to see something you wanted to see, and you'd ask him for. A few bob the night before. Nah, get onto your bed now. Don't be talking about that damn old picture. You should be practicing your pipes, you know. <laughs> and of course, you'd wake up the next morning to five bob a beep yeah, beside the bed right. anyway, and he'd go and enjoy it, you know, and put remember to practice your pipes. Do you remember you told me before? Um, I, went, I went to the tell PJ. <coughs> yeah. he, when um, he came back one night after being out with the boys, and uh, he woke you up and the light, oh, yeah. with the light off and made you put your pipes back together. He went into the room, the spare room he used to keep, you know, guests, people coming up and stay. It was the big front room, you know. And um, I used to, that was the music room. So I had the pipes in there, and I, I heard them inside in the room, and he actually took all the reeds out of the pipes, and he put them in the case, and he says, go in and I put them together. And I think it was a bet, you know, with a couple of the boys downstairs, you know. <laughs> so when I went to put the light on, he said, no, do it in the dark, because you're going to have to do it sometime in the dark. Let's see you do it. So I put all the reeds together and tuned the pipes up with the light in the room and then the place leave them on. And he came over and he just patted me on the head. He says, that's it now. And why did you think you'd have to do it in the dark at some stage? I mean, no, no, he just said, he just, he, you know, he was one of them. He'd say, you know, get the reed out. The fellas pulling reeds out and of course it'd stick, the chanter stock would stick and you'd crack the reed. So you had to be very careful with everything, you know. And he just made you understand that this cane costs money, you know, that you make reeds from it. Just the instrument was important enough, you know. How old would you have been when he did that? When he, ah, oh, I mean, only about maybe nine or ten. But oh, yeah. I did it myself after that. I used to turn the light out and tune the pipes up for the crack. Yeah. yeah, and I remember when uh, young Paddy Keenan was growing up, we did often went up to Paddy's house and we turned the lights off and we put, put the two sets of pipes together yeah. in the dark, you know. But it was great fun, you know, because mm. you have to feel around where you're going with the drones and everything, and then it gives you a great ear. You know, it gives you an unbelievable ear, you know, because you're tuning in the dark and your senses, you've no eyesight yeah. to look around. So everything is going straight to your ear. So it actually was great tuning for your ear, you know, so you could get, you know, I still have perfect pitch. You How know. long did it take you to do it? I don't know. Five minutes. You've done five minutes in the dark at nine years old. I <laughs> legend. So I knew the pipes, like, you know, you close your eyes when you play, you know, and I just knew the pipes, knew the regulars. And, all you had to do was just feel the rigs, different size of reeds and put them in, check them mm. in. You, know, you, like, you, you were doing things back, back then, like at that age, like, you know, you're a young teenager and stuff, and you were doing things that uh, fellas spent their whole life trying to do. Like, how old were you when you wrote it on some boat, man? Oh, jeez, man, I can't remember. Long time ago, I was Martin about... Me, your son Martin told me one time, um, I asked him about it, I think he said you were around 40. Well, I wrote it on the banjo in the beginning, I would have been about 16, but I put it on the flute then, um, when I was, uh, after I got married to Sheila, I remember, about oh, yeah. 1968, I changed it from the banjo to the flute. And then you invented that flute as well? Yeah, and then the flute came later, the flute came in 1970, the Overton flute. That was a bamboo flute, you look at the album Eddie and I made, The Dawning of the Day, you'll see the bamboo flute, uh, and I put it down on a chair in a session in Coventry one night, on this big sham. He was a Kerry fella, set, put his big ass down on top of him and broke the flute. And he was so embarrassed about it, you know. And I didn't matter, it was my fault putting it there anyway. Then we did everything to, to try and get this flute back together, it didn't work. So Bernard Oban, who was a, a metal turner, that's what he did, he worked for Jaguar, the car factory in Coventry. So he brought, got to me some aluminium piping and stuff, and so I told him what to do, just that time when we made the flute anyway. He engineered it and I tuned it and put it together. And um, so he always said to me, even through down through the years, he said, he should have, you know, he was made redundant, so he didn't have any money, you know. I remember at the time, we had not much. So he offered, he offered me a few bob for the, I said, no, just make me a flute any time I need it, you know. So I got Paddy Keane and the first set, full set of flutes made oh. from him. And then I got Davies Milan, another set. So they came into Ireland through Davy and Paddy, you know, oh. and myself. Because we grew up together, you know, and Davy, we taught Davy between me and Paddy, the two was going to move in, especially Paddy's father would have given Davy a great part of his life, you know. So it was lovely. So when I brought the, the full set of flutes in, um, so Paddy looked it. So last time I saw Paddy there now, he's 
he somebody robbed a big sea flute that he had, you know, it was gorgeous in in America. So I got I had a spare one and I gave it to him, so he has it and it's a beaut, you know. But he plays it lovely as well. So I mean, you know, we've all that was all that time, you know, it was share and share like, you know. Yeah. I wasn't like one of these people that would take something and oh, this is mine, you know. No. And I was never like that, you know, and that the flute went around the world then, you know, with the Bothy band and with Paddy and all of that stuff, you know. So and you know, it's, it's all I've looked at I've seen it in Japanese orchestras, so I couldn't believe it, you know. And there's a guy playing the Overton flute, you know. So it's all over all over the world at the moment, you know. So it's it's we invented a new instrument, which is great. But we put the Paddy name on the blank stuff, you know. <laughs> it was great, you know. Great, so great days. You could you know. have made you could have made a million out of that <coughs> if you'd taken a commission off every flute that was sold. Didn't bother me. Didn't even think about it. I was just thinking about music, you know, at the time, and it still doesn't bother me even today. A man died a few years ago, and he came to see me, <coughs> and he wrote a book, and it's all in there. And he said, "If you ever want to challenge me," I said, "Why would I do that?" You know, because he wrote it in the book that I designed it, and he made it for me. You know, so that's it. So it doesn't matter anyway, you know, he's, he raised his family on it and I think that was great, you know. He's a great old jazz musician, he played the piano, he played a bit of classical guitar. But he knew nothing about flutes or whistles, you know. But he was amazed, you know, that so many people jumped on him, you know. Which is great, you know. So it doesn't bother me, you know, I mean, he had a great life, you know, and he loved the idea that he was a part of that instrument, you know. So it was good, you know, good times. Hmm. That was really doing it, doing it for the music. That was what it was all about. We really didn't care, you know, Eddie. You know, well, I didn't care. Yeah. Eddie used to be always saying to me, "Oh, you know, he's still in a lot of those flutes and things like that." I really didn't. I didn't bother me. I just said, "Great, as long as there's people getting them out there, you know." Because yeah. we were great for the, you know, the pipes are very limited. The concert set, you know, or you have to, like, you can only get a couple of keys with them, you know. If you're like, you have to carry two sets of pipes, you know but to really get a couple of decent keys going. Mm. But the flutes stopped all of that. Because you could get a whole set of flutes and you could get any key you like, mm. you know. So yeah. now Eddie and I were comfortable to move, you know, and Eddie could move into different keys where you could change the singing in the there. pipes we were singing nearly in the two same keys all the time, you know, yeah. it was either G or D, yeah, you know, yeah, with the concerts there, or if you like. And I eventually got a concert chanter, so I used to carry the two chanters, the E chanter, the D chanter, and then I got a C chanter. So I used to just change the chanters around and I used to use the regulators as drones. I'd keep an elastic band and people used to laugh at me and I'd just pick the elastic band up and put it on the regulator and it would hold the regulator down. So I had created. Yeah, I created drones instead of, you know, having the other drones and then played the below regulators, you know, just the two on the right. So the bass regulators I'd use as a drone, you know, for the, the other chanters. So it was great, it was very interesting, you know. But tough, you know, with the pipes on the road now, you know, especially when you're gigging big gigs and, you know, Eddie and I did very, we put 5,000 people into the Corona Hall in Munich. Mm. We weren't, and we had album of the year in Germany and stuff like that. That was good. Never mind England, you know, I mean, uh, Britain and all, you know, we were massive in the continent, Switzerland. Holland, there we go. Yeah, and it's not true that you had, uh, did, you have, did you have three number one albums down in um, South Africa? But you, we had, you'd never yeah, went down and we had um, three number one albums in Australia, New Zealand, and at the same time in South Africa. Some and I played it in 2010, South Africa, Johannesburg. Yeah, I you, were, you were marshal at, uh, I was was at the first St. Patrick's or something, yeah? Yeah, it was a St. Patrick's week, but like, they couldn't have St. Patrick's Day because it's a working day in Johannesburg. So they decided to have it the day before, which was like a Sunday, you know. Oh, right. So I was, they asked me would I do a concert. And I said, all right, but we treated it as Paddy's Day, although Paddy's Day was the next day. Yeah, you know, yeah, anyway. yeah. And um, they, I said, yeah. So we filled the 2,000 seat to hall and then people were going looking for more tickets, 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 tickets. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, in the end, uh, the Soweto Choir uh, decided they were going to back me. And they came up. And they, I couldn't believe it, a whole lot of them. And they had all the beautiful um, costumes on. Amazing, amazing choir. I brought my youngest son Finbar with me. So he had his guitar with him and I had just myself and um, Paul O'Driscoll. That was it. And Stephen on keyboards from Claire, you know. And uh, I couldn't believe it when she says, we just sold out an 11,000 seater park behind this hotel, the Crown Hotel. 
I said 11,000 cheating mackerel. I said, that's a huge guy. I've never played for anything, anything bigger than, you know, maybe, you know, I've never played for that much anyway. I couldn't believe it when it done, the roar went up, you know. Wow. And they all knew Sweet 16, they knew, they knew our stuff, I couldn't believe it, you know. Yeah, but you've, you've brought it. was amazing. You've brought that. What, I, what I love about your music is, the, first of all, the, the passion that you have, you, you can't hide it, it's just, you play, nearly all your body is going, you know. And like, there's, a, there's only very few guys, like Luke Kelly did that when he sang, and you know, that passion that you have, um, that's the first thing. But the next thing is, with you, <coughs> you, you've brought it all over the world. You've made it work all over the world. You've brought Irish culture and music to all parts of the world, and people love you for it. People who are not even Irish, okay. you know. And then on top of that, in today's world, you're still writing, you're still creating, you're still moving it forward, right. you know. Like you've been doing that from the start, man. And I mean, that, that's you've dedicated your life to it. And you know, someone should tell you that that's without right. you, it, we wouldn't have had. You're an institution with a lot of that, you know. And like, no, you, we, we need guys like that, you know. That's I legend. Just, legend just, is a word that gets thrown around a lot these days, but I love certainly. talking to you, like yourself, you know. And the young musicians coming up, young songwriters, it's great because there's so much space in Ireland for songwriting, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, like it was at the gig the other night now in in Killarney last week, and young Nathan Carter came. Mm -hmm. He brought his grandmother along, you know. It was her birthday. And he drove her all the way down from the north. She wanted to see me. And he was playing there only a couple of nights later. But I think that's lovely. And he came backstage and he introduced me to him. And he was mad in the Sweet Sixteen. I mean himself. And I love that. There's so much room out there, you know, for all different types of music. And he's a country singer, you know. But he's a great ballad singer too, you know. And we had the likes of Joe Dolan. Joe was brilliant. I love to see Joe in action, you know. Yeah. So I have no borders in music, you know. Yeah. It's important, yeah. but... It's important to, to I, I know I know what you mean about it. Yeah. Not, not, you're, you're not pigeonholing yourself no. in one genre, and that's what I love. Mm -hmm. And you you like you 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 change things up, but it's great, you it's also know that it's important to keep yeah. our Irish mm -hmm. thing going. Yeah. And you're doing both, you know, yeah. you're doing the whole lot. Like if I see Paddy Cole on, I'll go if I'm from close enough. I'll go and see Paddy or Dicky Rock. I'll go and see Dicky yeah. for the crack, you know. Yeah. And I have a bit of crack of wine. I was, you know, a bit of laugh. Sweet, they're good crack, you know. Sweet sixteen has been mentioned here, and I just wanted to kind of throw my take on it because at the time I was working in Pirate Radio yeah. and it was kind of non-stop sort of American rock and roll and British pop music and the odd <coughs> Irish record and then like it didn't this this song came out of nowhere and you're playing we were playing it in between Boston more than a feeling and Bon Jovi mm -hmm. living on a prayer mm -hmm. and it was on our A-list and it, the way we were, we were young fellas, like we thought we knew everything about rock music and yeah. what the hell was this song doing? And I mean, it just <laughs> took over. D tell me a little bit about Sweet Sixteen because that, that, was, that was the big world breaker because it broke into top 40 format the world over. Well, we started, uh, we put the band together in 1976. You know, Eddie and I put the other two brothers in Davy and with us. And uh, I remember the first uh, big song we had in Ireland at the time was. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. Ralph McTell had just written it and gave it to Eddie. And so Eddie was supposed, just to work it on, Eddie was supposed to sing the Greenfields of France, but he was out all night, pissed with Luke, Ellie up in the <laughs> embankment. And he was harsh, he had no voice, you know, we'd only one window at this. And I, I, I knew the words anyway, you know, so I went in and sang it. And that's how I started singing with the band. I pulled back, because Eddie was a singer. I was a musician, you know, although I'd sing, but never on stage. Because that was Eddie's job, you know. And was a thing we had when we were kids. Though. He was a singer, I was a musician, yeah. But this time, I sang it anyway, and it went. Then, we like a few years later, my father died in 1979, and uh, I was I was in bits. You know, it was just something unbelievable had been taken away, you know. And I remember cleaning out uh, his case. My mother said, "Would you go up to his room and he keeps the case in there and just see what's in it?" You know, she didn't want to go near it. And they did a few sort of things, private things in the case. And just going through it, I found the words of Sweet Sixteen. He'd written them out, you know. And uh, yeah, he'd written one verse and one chorus. That's all that was ever in it. And Harry Lauder had put another verse onto it, which he always said wasn't long to the song. So I said to my mother, what do you want me to do with this, this song? And she says, oh, God, say, why don't you learn that? She says, your father used to sing that, and he had a few points on him. He used to do a good job in it. And she said, that's the way she said, I said, oh, okay. 
So I went upstairs, I knew the song anyway, and I got the five string. I hadn't touched the five string banjo since I left the Clancy Brothers. That iconic riff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've gone back daddy on the five string when we were in Germany. That was about it, you know. But I, we, I sat down with the banjo, wrote the piece of music, just took it because it was too short, the song. And just bang, went straight into number one. Terry Wogan loved it. Terry played it off the air in England. Gay Bourne loved it. And, you know, I even when I, mean, I met Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Campbell here, uh, Shim Shakushli, and I sang it, he never was never off the phone to me. He phoned me up two or three times a week. He wanted me to go to Arizona and record a banjo piece with him. And I said, no, I'm not going all the way to Arizona to record three seconds of music. There has to be a banjo player over there that could do it, you know. So and he had me haunted. Eventually he did it himself with the guitar, you know. But um, it's just amazing, you know, you're sitting in a cafe, we say I was in Paris with my wife a few years ago, sitting in a cafe, just having coffee, and all of a sudden I just hear this orchestra and they're playing the melody of Sweet Sixteen. But they actually have the banjo piece in. Oh, yeah. They're wrote, so it's a part of it now all over the yeah. world, you know, and it's great. Yeah. The, the, the first note or two, you know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know exactly what's coming, <laughs> and, and you know. <laughs> so that's another little bit, you know. So, I uh, it was around 2008, 2009. The um, I was after doing the City by the Lee uh, song with that and all that, and, and I was after doing the Half Moon theater and stuff. So I think it was um, was it Dominic? Uh, no, 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 no. The guy who was promoting that gig in Cork that time was it Dominic? Uh, um, what was she? Uh, I forget his surname. Mm. I remember it in a minute. Okay. Um, no, so. Um, I got a call, what did I want to open up for, uh, Fimber Fury in the Cock Opera House, so I was about uh, 21, I'd say, Tw around uh, 20, 21, and I was going, did I what, you know, did I what, you know, so um, part of that gig then, remember we did a, there was a thing in, in the Flying Enterprise, oh, yeah. yeah, lounge, and and we had, it was like a promo thing for the, the gig in three weeks time, so I was in, um, and, and I, I was I was on before a Finbar, same kind of thing, you know, and I remember I was just getting up to uh, walk off, to off, leave Finbar, come out and do his thing, you know. And he just caught me by the arm and he goes, Sham, do you know the boat, man? I was like, yes, <laughs> there I go, man. I mean, do I want, I have an opportunity to do something with Finbar. And he, he did it, you know, and he made me feel great and he made the people, you know, mm. give me a chair and stuff. And then there was the next thing, he says, um, do you know Sweet 16, getting back to the topic? I was like, this is like, you know, any young fella trying to be a folk singer, writing songs yeah, yeah. or whatever, you know, getting to do that with a guy like him, you yeah. know, and the two, the Portman and, and uh, Sweet Sixteen, fucking blew me away. But I remember there, there's a video of it on YouTube somewhere where um, we go around about four times just on that riff, yeah. you know, and I'm going, <laughs> man, this is the stuff that dreams are made of for a kid like me, you yeah, know. So, yeah, yeah right. I really appreciate that, it's you know. It's one of these pieces of music that'll stay forever, you know and um, somebody else is going to record it in the future in a different way, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's great, you know, I mean, you know, we, we always, you know, Eddie and I, the brothers George as well, Paul was a great musician too, but like we were never satisfied just doing it that way. We always wanted to do it different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what we got our hands on, we had to do it different, you know, because, you know, we, and anything we ever recorded would be completely different from anything else we ever did, you know, if yeah. we recorded it. Like we took a song, like I remember Eddie taking um what would we do? Uh oh a long long way from Claire to here, sorry. When he got it off Ralph, it was completely different. <laughs> so Eddie wanted to change the words, you know, I, I heard the, you know, he we put a piper in instead of a fiddler, you know. Mm. And he changed a lot of the word and the melody. And when Ralph heard it, Ralph says, God he says, You not only changed the whole melody to Greenfields of France, he says, but you changed all of that melody, he says it's fantastic and he loved now he does it the way we do it, because yeah. every time he comes to Ireland to do it, yeah, he starts singing it his way. Of course, the audience would take it over, yeah. and because they knew it the way we did, so he ended yeah. up singing. Yeah. I think that's the great thing about the great songs, though, in any genre of music, but I think particularly Irish. I, I was taking a, a walk of all places down Shop Street in Galway about four or five years ago, just up there for the weekend, yeah. and there's this big Danish fella, like he's the size of a house, and his xylophone is the width of a car, yeah. and he's playing the xylophone. And just as I'm walking past, he starts launching into, in, in, into um, Sweet Sixteen, the riff of Sweet Sixteen. 
I said, he's not going to do that on a flipping xylophone. And he did, with all the ornamentations and everything. It was brilliant. It was great. Yeah. But I love it, you know. I mean, I you know, was over in Spain there. Was in, uh, um, a couple of friends of mine have a house over there, you know. So I go and visit them, Jimmy and Charlie and the boys. And uh, it's just amazing. You walk down, you go into the one of the pubs and there's a new singer, a new kid in town, you know, and you go to hear him. And he says, you might as well listen to me. He's having Eddie years ago. Yeah. He's doing, doing Eddie stuff or doing the Dubliner stuff, you know. It's, mm. And they just love it, you know. Mm. It's great. I think it's just, Irish music is something for people, pulls people together, you know. Mm. It's just amazing, you know, when you think well, about people it. People know the songs the world over, you know. Um, there's a couple of, you know, really great songwriters whose songs are really part of Ireland. Uh, a great pal of ours, Liam Riley. You know, mm. Liam's after yeah. coming and doing a lot of song collective sessions with us. I mean, no matter where you go in the world, you do hear Boston Nose, Streets of New York, Summer in Dublin, you know. Pete St. John is another guy, of course, the Fields of Retinoy, Dublin are there all the times. The Mayor, uh, the Ferryman, you know. Mm. Um, guys like that, Phil Coulter, you know, the Tongue mm. of so well, you did Steal Away too, you know. Like, all these, just, there's a, without those guys, Jimmy McCarthy's another guy, you know. Like, yeah. great, great songwriters. People forget sometimes that we are only in Ireland. And to be producing this at such a high level for so yeah. long, you know, I mean, Irish musicians are among the best in the world. That's you know? actually an interesting one, Finbar. Like, what is it about the Irish music? Because I've noticed this, not just working as a broadcaster and playing music as a DJ and stuff like that, that there's, some, there's nothing more enduring than a well written Irish song. Why is that? I think my brother Eddie summed it up in a, in a good way one night. This guy, you two had just come out, you know at the time and they were tearing the world apart and this young kid says hey, my brother Eddie we were in Australia at the time he said oh there's a new um, group out there at the moment you two everybody's singing their music and then he says during the day at night he says they're singing the Furies and he was right because all the immigrants all the lads that would leave home they would go rock and roll in the afternoon when they go home at night time they put the ballads on and then whatever it is it's just something from home. home. Yeah. And, for that little and that's the truth, sort of you know, and, that yeah. is, and I thought Eddie, yeah, he nailed it on the head that, that one. That's well, how, how does yeah. that make you feel knowing that your voice and your playing and stuff, um, <coughs> it makes people who are Irish, no matter where they are in the world, young, young or old, but you, it, makes, it feel, makes them feel they're back in Ireland or they're, they're missing right. home, like it creates the emotion, you know. How does that make you feel knowing that you're giving people a sense of identity? Well, I've done it myself. I've had albums, you know, I used to stick on Luke singing an English song or the dubs, you know, or whoever, you know. And I, you know, I'd put Liam Clancy on singing an song. You get lonely when you work my home, you know, you put it on. And I, I was the same. I was just in the same boat, you know. I just had put my own music on, you know, fed up listening to myself. I'd put somebody else on, you know. <laughs> but I mean, you know, and we all do it, you know, and as I said, and he put it right, he says, you might be listening to rock and roll in the daytime, but at night time they're listening to the ballads, you know, mm. and he's right, you know, and that's the truth, we take it with us. It's something, you know, I think Irish music, my father put it in a nutshell, he said it was, Irish music is like a well, you know, you come along, and you write your music and you put your music into a well, and it's a big, huge well, you know, and any the kids don't want to take a mouthful, they take a cup, and they drink a good cup of this beautiful music and take it with them. So they take a take a good heritage with them. So they know where they come from, you know. And it keeps them alive, you know, when they're away from home, you know. You gives them an identity, you know. You told me that one time about your dad, about the, the music and stuff, and he said to you, um, you pay your rent from it and you move on. That's right. And that you often said that on stage then, it's like, well, I, it, he said, it, actually, your words to me were that um, it belongs to the kids of the country and part of the heritage right. now, you know. you pay rent from it and you move back. It's a great way of not, like he said, not owning it. I know no artists' rights and stuff should be looked after too, but, you know, it's, don't don't stick to that. When we talk Keep to Christy going. Dignam, it's the same. Yeah. Christy is thinking, and so does Damien Dempsey. Talk to Damien, it's the same, you know. Any great artist I know, you know, a great singer or a great songwriter, they know this music doesn't belong to them. It doesn't belong to me. I write it and I put it out there on stage, you know. But in the end, it belongs to when they pass on, it'll be there for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, Fimber wrote that in such and such a year, you know, same thing, I know that there was great songs written, you know, 50 years ago when I was only growing up at the time, you know. And Joe Heaney, without Joe Heaney, and the great, and Nicholas Tobin from, you know, from Ring, 
and these great Chanel singers, you know, who kept the beautiful music alive. And I learned it from, you know, from the boys, you know, and the laments. And now the young pipers are taking it off me, and they're learning, you know. So it's lovely. It's like it's it's a, it's like it's like a well. It's like a. I think it's. And it's like an Amazonian waterfall. It never stops flowing. So, something that, since working with Roy the last few years, I've developed a very keen interest in, in, in into music of all kinds all my life. But that, particularly, no matter where the song comes, you want to who actually wrote that. It's an Irish song. It's been sung. You could it's sung in darkest Africa. It's an Irish song. You want to know who wrote that, and it's important to find out who wrote that song because at the end of the day, someone produced. This three or four minutes. Well, I always say it on stage. I will say this song was written by Eric Bogle or this song was written by yeah. Phil Coulter or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. I always do that. I think that's very important mm-hmm. for especially young artists coming up, you know, young songwriter. If you are singing other people's stuff, yeah, you must give them a mention. I know a lot of artists don't do that, you know. But it's important to understand that. Mm-hmm. These days, Finbar, you can look that stuff up. You know, for example, Sweet 16 and uh, uh, Thornton, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, Jimmy Thornton and stuff. So, yeah. like, you know. You have to go on and look it up. Like, if you're interested in it, you're going to do it anyway. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You said that to me years ago, PJ, about... Um, you said to me about uh, your research that you've done on all the songs and stuff. And I remember looking at you going, like, I never saw it as, a re- as research. I would come home from school and I'd want to pick up my instrument and sing some ballad mm. or something, you know? And I want, I used to spend my pocket money, like, going in and buying um, uh, the records of Irish artists be- just because I wanted it. And the thing that I don't like about... Today's world is it's all download. I used to love getting the sleeve and reading who yeah. did it, who played, who did what. It was education. It's a, you know? it's a different world now, right? You know, if, I mean, even from when you were a kid, and, uh, and when I was a kid, you know, it's completely different. I, I, I my kids download all the time, you know, yeah. and I think it's fantastic. I actually do. It. You got a thousand songwriters at the touch of a button, you know, mm, that yeah. you can go into in our day. You had to go in and dig them out and find out where they came from. Then you, can, you know exactly where it yeah, yeah, who exactly. wrote it, where it came from. So I'm amazed, you know, like when my youngsters were, were like uh, Robert and them now, they're sort of they were into the computers and stuff like now. Martin, the oldest fella, he's he's brilliant. Like, but he was on computers when he was a tiny man. tot. What a songwriter, yeah. yeah he's great. And he's an incredible singer as well. And a fine musician, man. He'd play anything for you. He's a great songwriter. He's a serious, serious man about music, you know. And I love that he has all his music with him and he can put it into a computer and he can actually record going along if he has to ask. Me, I still use the pen and paper, you know. I have to write it out, you know. But um, he's amazing. But I, I think it's our technology. It's the more, more we have, the better it is, you know, especially for... Musicians coming through, you know, yeah, okay. somewhere. Mm. Yeah. A lot of a lot of artists look at Spotify for artists. For, yeah. and they say, "Jesus, now that's ruining music." But do you know what? Is it really though? It's just a way of getting your song to ten million people all at one time. You know? I think the problem there, PJ, is that someone that what they're saying is that the money being generated oh, from it is going to someone else and yeah. not the artist. I think yeah. that's the argument. I don't think anybody... I think, I think the way it is set up now, the money goes to the artist, I think it's good, you know. Mm. And they have it in a situation now where it's, it's, it's actually, you can't get away with anything uh, really, you know, sticky, if you like, you know. Mm. You know, I find that I've got royalties coming in now from different parts of the world. Jeez, I never knew that existed, you know. Yeah, but you're going to play as well. But the stuff is coming there, you know, and I'm going, wow, you know, it's all three songs, or they played that on the radio down in Fiji, you know. <laughs> I'm going, wow, and you got, you know, four pence out of it, you know, or whatever it is, you know, or something like that. Like, you can all these, give you this big load of paper, all these writings on it, and at the end of the whole lot, you say, 41 euro, mother of Jay, you know, you're reading for an hour, you know. But, like, at least you're getting from away, you know, you, yeah. you didn't get that before, yeah. you know. I wanted, so ask, great, yeah. I wanted to ask you, I know I changed topic here, but I wanted to ask you about something that um, I, I don't really hear you talk a whole lot about, but another side to your folk music. You were on tour with, uh, what do you call it, folk friends, with um, Daryl Adams and yeah. Ramblin' Jack Elliot, who I love as well. Yeah. You know, and uh, who else was in there? It was, uh, it was uh, Alex Campbell. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. what was that like? That was amazing. They're on giants as well, like. Yeah, well, these guys would have been, you know, like the the third. I never met Woody Guthrie. I would have loved to have met him. I met Daryl Adams, and Jack Elliott. You wrote Daryl in the rain for him. Yeah, yeah. And we uh, we toured together. Danny Thompson on bass, you know, and Alex 
Campbell from Glasgow. I mean, th- there was just these guys with these like they were in their fifties when I was in my twenties. You know that way. And they were just amazing, you know, and to be accepted by them and go on the road with them. And Daryl taught me an awful lot about the banjo, you know. Like, Daryl used to play the fighting with one finger and a thumb. That was it. Like, and you look at bluegrass players and they're flying at a million miles an hour, you know. Daryl wasn't interested in that music. Daryl played Appalachian music and it was all that. It's all that backbeat, you know. And it's straight out of the mountains, you know, of, you know, Portland, you know, that's where. He grew up in New York, but he was born in Portland when he was a kid. But like they went to, they came to France during the fifties. Uh, the band, the bomb, when the atomic bomb had come out, you know, it was just after they dropped the bomb in Hiroshima, you know. It was 40, 1945 August, I think it was. I can't remember. Anyway, it was, but they they never stopped, you know, fighting against the system all the time, you know. And they were totally anti-war, the whole lot of them. But anyway, Woody Guthrie went back and. To uh, Daryl's surprise, because Daryl used to say he joined the goddamn navy, <laughs> so he went back and joined the navy, and that was it. You know, that was it. But uh, both of them were very heavy on the drink in France and Paris at the time, so they ended up in hospital. And uh, Jack got better before Daryl, so Jack decided to go back home. So we, I met up with Daryl, and Daryl never went back to the states. Daryl stayed and lived in Antwerp. So I met up with Daryl at a uh, a festival in 1972, I think, with Tom Paxson was there, and I hadn't seen Tom since I was 12. You know. But you recorded him. Um, I recorded him. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, that's one of Tom Paxson. And uh, it was nice to see Tom. You know, and of course Tom was, and Daryl were great buddies. You know, so I got to really know Daryl through Tom, and I toured with Daryl and toured with Tom. And we had great times together, but just. To, the teaching of Daryl with the banjo, and his knowledge of five string banjo was amazing, and his knowledge of American folk music was enormous, you know. And you coming from your background of the Irish stuff and getting this new education from guys in the fifties, you know, in your twenties right. picking stuff up. What a what a what a time to be it on the road, you know. You know. I remember, a, I won't say the name, but there was an Irish musician anyway. Well, he says he's Irish anyway, and uh, he was playing a bit anyway one night with us. And he came out of this room and he says, I can't play with them. They're goddamn drunks. Two of them are pissed out of their brains. And they weren't. Daryl hadn't touched drink for years. And Jack hadn't touched drink for years either. So there was this fellow who was just being ego tripper, you know. And I said to him, do you realise, I said, the chance you have here? These guys, I said, you know, you do Woody Guthrie, I said, for a living. I said, these guys knew him and travelled yeah, with him. You could learn so much by talking to him about Woody, you know. He wouldn't even do that, you know. I remember saying, anyway, he was dumped from the tour at the time. And um, he was just a backing musician uh, at the time, you know. And um, there it just, I didn't book him, I was there on the boys to come, but they, he had no time for this, you know. And it was the first time I ever saw ego appear, you know. And Daryl had no time for ego, and neither did Jack Elliott, you know. They just got rid of him, you know. And uh, the guy could have learned so much, you know. That's the truth. But he just chose to take another road, you know. Did you meet him? Um, I know uh, Jack Elliott especially, and, and Dylan have a great connection, you know. Mm. And they kind of uh, a lot of people think that uh, um, that's where that influence came from, you know. Mm. But um, you, I know you met Dylan once. I saw it on a, a thing you did before. But um, was that true? Was that was that true, uh, Jack Elliott, or was it true, uh, the Clancy's? No, the Clancy's. Clancy's. It was in the Marriott Hotel in Chicago, and uh, Al Grossman, his manager at the time, he wore these blue. I'd never seen blue sunglasses before in my life, and he was a big, huge guy, and he had this big fur coat on. It was the middle of winter, and he just came in. He had an album under his arm, and he talked to Liam. But he just, we were introduced. We just shook his hand, and that's it. But he just came to see Liam, so we went back to the bar and we were having a drink, but. It was amazing to meet him because yeah. the, I, I loved blowing in the wind and when yeah, he brought it out as a kid, a I, loved, I always loved it, you know, and I always thought it would be perfect for the banjo, you know, but um, I got a chance to record it then, you know, a few years ago. But he was, uh, he was just, I mean, you must remember, he was an absolute god in music, you know. Six he was a huge, yeah. huge star, you know, and just to be in the same room as him was fantastic. What a great poet and what an amazing songwriter, you know what I mean? And again, Never folk, be anybody folk like folk music uh, giant as well. I know he, he crossed over as well, like, but you're t- blowing in the wind, like, what a, what a song, you know? I mean, 
Well, we never got a chance really to, to do it, you know, with him or anything like that, you know, because we were on the run with the Clancy's at the time. We were touring hard, you know. Mm. And it was just nice to cross paths. Same with Pete Seeger. I met Pete Seeger in New York. And again, thank you. I met Pete in New York. And again, it was lovely to meet up with Pete Seeger. Just for, again, it was only a half an hour yeah. chatting the whole night. He loved the Lonesome Boatman. Oh, yeah. He loved it. And they had a, sh- a boat going up and down the Hudson River, which is called the Freedom uh, Boat, where they all went on, John Baez and Bob Dylan, they all went oh. on this boat. And uh, Clancy Brothers never went on it. The boys would there were two. They would didn't you know, the, it was there if we wanted to go on it, Eddie and I. But we sort of chose not to, you know, because we were with the Clancy's and we wouldn't, you know, once we were with them, we were with them, you know. Yeah. It was two different groups, you know. And um, But he did use the Lonesome Boatman on it and he used to play it on the ship, on the boat with I them. Wonder, and so I, I like that, you know. I wanted to ask you about the Boatman. Where were you? when you wrote it and how like did you write it over a period of time or did it, where did it come to you and like what was your inspiration to to write a, a, a tune about like was it always supposed to be associated with uh, uh, the, no, the sea and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. when I wrote it it was about um, it always reminds me when I close my eyes of the man who brings you from this life to the next yeah. the boatman you know they put the coins in your yeah. mouth or they yeah. put it on your eyes you know if the money is dirty, he won't take it. So it was just a story my father told me years ago. And it was like, when you die, the boat on takes you across, you know. So he's a lonesome moment. And I always thought to myself, I wonder how long he's there, you know, <laughs> taking people across. <laughs> he's very lonesome. <laughs> yeah, I was only a kid at the time. So I thought, huh, we should raise him a tune. And then one day, of course, it was always in Galway with the outfit, and you see all the, the lads out with the crooks, you know, just doing the salmon fish and the little small old crooks, you know. And uh, I think it all triggered one, one after the other. But I know when I play it, I can see him, you know, and he just comes in. You can hear the water, you know, coming through the mist. Yeah, was and he puts his hand out for the money, and if the money is dirty, it goes through his fingers, and he just goes back, <laughs> and you're left there. So my father always said, if he doesn't take the money, you become a ghost. So, so it's a great myth, you know. <laughs> and we're keeping the kids uh, yeah, in, in check as well, you know. But I love them, I love them stories, you know. Retirement is not exactly on, on the is, plans. I don't understand the word. So to, to finish Finbar in one minute, if there's one moment or one song or one person or one thing. That, that made it all worth it. Yeah, make it all, yeah. The, the one thing that, that, like, your heart is yeah. in, that you were like, that was worth it for that. Uh, meeting Sheila. Sheila. <laughs> 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 oh, You're listening to the Song Collector podcast, brought to you from Cork, Ireland, by Roy Buckley Music. I uh, like I said. Roy, you could listen to him tell stories all night long and, and, and then do, listen to a gig and then listen to more stories because... You know what? We, we could do another podcast with him and we wouldn't run out of things to talk about. <laughs> you could talk to him again and you'd have all new stuff. You'd have new you. stuff. Even talking about his dad and everything there. I, I, I love all that, you yeah, know. Yeah. Ted Fury was another legend. Yeah. He was still... Uh, kind of gave, gave them all the hunger and gave a lot of other people the hunger too, travelling around with all these really great musicians. Fimba will tell you, like... Uh, Stepping over the bodies in, in, in the parlour of the house going to school, like, and they're stepping over other legends, like, you know, <laughs> and stuff. Uh, yeah, th- and they're, they're the reason why, um, like, uh, folk music is so popular and the hunger and the fire is still there for it, you know. And the great thing about those stories is the crazier they sound, the truer they are. And that's the, <laughs> that's the weird thing about yeah. it. I want to move on, right, because we're, we're going to talk about Bagatelle. They're coming to the Opera House again. When I was your age and younger, Bagatelle were were the biggest thing. Yeah, huge. And he's talked about Shimsa Kushli and how you couldn't have it without Bagatelle. And I think a lot of people sort of thought Bagatelle went away, but they didn't. They but, toured the world how many times? Uh, they're still touring the world. But um, I, I would say that a lot of people don't know that some of the songs that uh, uh, Bagatelle have put out were written by Liam. I'm talking songs like The Streets of New York or Boston Rose. People might associate with uh, The Wolf Tones or something. Yes. But, uh, Flight of Earls, Paddy Riley right. had a number one with that. All Liam songs. And when I'm introducing Liam at the Song Tector session, I, I, I always say, when you have written one song, 
that wherever Irish people gather, mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. is sung, you've achieved something. When you've written a half a dozen. Well, okay. if you think of it, like, I mean, anywhere in Ireland or outside of Ireland and there's a, a, a session happening, you're going to hear Streets of New York, you're going to hear Boston Rose, you're going to hear Summer in Dublin, um, mm. you know, people like... Flight of Earls. Flight of Earls, yeah. You know, these great, great songs. Um, I love songs like Raining in Paris and Johnny Set Him Up Tonight and Leeson Street yeah. Lady and they're all dynamite. But... Um, Somewhere in Europe, which was the Eurovision. 1990, yeah. yeah. Came second with Yugoslavia. It. He's still got it to this day, but only coming second. <laughs> well, he should have uh, He should have won that. He should have won it that but, night, yeah. Uh, so Liam was after doing a, a load of these song glitter sessions with us in Cork, Kerry, Port Leash. He even yeah. came to Las Vegas with us for the... Um, do you yeah. know that uh, Liam Ridley broke a Guinness World Record with... Um, the, we, the, we spoke about this on, on, on a previous podcast with the Black Donnellys yeah. when, we, when we went to Vegas. Dave Brown um, and Dave Rooney did the longest concert idea and we all played on it so mm. we all have a, a Guinness World Record because yeah. of it. Liam included. He came over and did two, two uh, shows with us. What a crack. Do you know what the boys in U2 used to nickname Bagatelle? Wow. Bag of money because uh, they wanted to, they, when they were coming up they, they wanted to be as successful as Bagatelle. That'll tell you. That's huge. That it? will tell you. All right, this is Summer in Dublin. Take me away from the city And lead me to where I can be on my own I wanted to see you and now that I have I just want to be left alone I'll always remember your kind words I'll still remember your name But I've seen you changing and turning And I know that things just won't be the same I remember that summer in Dublin And the lithiums that stank like hell Young people walking on Grafton Street And everyone looking so well I was singing a song I'd heard somewhere Called Rock and Roll Never Forgets When my humming was smothered by a 46A And the scream of a low flying jet so I jumped on a bus to Dunleary Stopping off to pick up my guitar And a drunk on the bus told me how to get rich I was glad we weren't going too far morning and trying to find a place where I can hear the wind and the birds and the sea on the rocks and where open roads always are near and if sometime I tire of the quiet and I want to walk back up that hill I'll just get on the road and I'll stick out my thumb Cause I know for sure you'll be there still
Roy, that's the mark of a great song. It's as fresh today as it was how long ago? Oh, was it 1980? 80, 80 yeah. was it? Yeah. 38 years ago. Wow. It's a 39 f- years ago. No, um, yeah, almost. Although, Wait, well, summertime. Well, I think it was on Liam's birthday, actually, that was released. Well, it's as fresh now as it was back it's then. It's, it's a, such well, a great song. What a song. You, my man, are opening for them. Yeah, I'm delighted I did it last year as well, but um, yeah, uh, always delighted to share, share a stage with uh, any of those lads or opening up for them or whatever. It's an excuse to meet up, yeah. you know, as well. And, and um, so I'm looking forward to it. Like, you can't say enough about no, them. No, this Performing is... at the highest level no. still, you know. Liam's yeah. voice never changed. No. He's never, um, he's never dropped the songs a key or anything no. he still performs them in the key that he recorded them in yeah, 40 does. years ago he or, does and or, it's, you know. it's, it really is and if there are tickets left that anybody wants to go see you know another thing um, we're talking about the hits there even Jim McCann caught a version of some of Summer in Dublin did he? yeah wow Yeah, you that I didn't know find that on YouTube or something yeah, yeah. deadly so you had Joe Dolan covering a couple of Liam's songs they were good pals yeah stuff you know so you mentioned YouTube um, you were putting these podcasts now they're up on YouTube aren't they they are and okay. they're on iTunes as well they are okay song collect podcast we're branching out PJ we're, we're branching out over. I tell you <laughs> and, and more to come and more episodes and more interviews I know that you're beavering away with a very busy diary for us over the next 12 months but look it's good to be back Roy uh, nice to have another one under our belts for people again to send in the new music we will very soon we'll do a show with some new music from some new artists song collector podcast at gmail.com Make sure that the quality the is... The highest possible quality that you can yeah. get to us. That's it for another day, my friend. Thanks, PJ. It's always great to see you, man. I'm enjoying these immensely. We'll talk again soon. And listen, everybody, please share the link. Share the shite out. <laughs> talk to you next day. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Song Collector Podcast, brought to you by Roy Buckley Music. Now, please share the link with your friends.